Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this service of celebration of honoring Mark Mellenbacher. We gather this afternoon to signal the end of a life and try to express what that means. We both grieve the loss of Mark and gather to celebrate his life. A man well loved as witness by all of you who have come. We gather to express our faith and our feelings as we say farewell, to acknowledge our loss and our sorrow, and also to reflect on our own mortality. Those who mourn need support and consolation. Your presence here today is a part of that ongoing support to Mark and his family. Welcome and thank you to the fire departments from the various communities in which Mark has worked. The Ancaster, Hamilton, Burlington, and St. Catharines. The innumerable firefighters from across Ontario. Thank you also to the many civil servants, honorable mayors, and dignitaries who represent the various communities. Your bearing, being here today honors Mark and it honors his family. Thank you for coming. As noted in the newspaper, the Honorable Mayor Brian McMullen is quoted as saying Mark was more than a fire chief. He was our friend and as such he will be missed by many. Mark was dear husband to Cindy, father to Brian, Jeff, and Kayla, a beloved son of Morris and Yvonne, a brother to Lori and Kim, also son and brother-in-law to Dan, Betty, Shelley, and Dean, and also a much-loved uncle and friend of all who knew him. We gather this afternoon to share memories, as precious as they are, and that is all that we have now. Photos and thoughts of a beloved friend who walked with us. And it is for that reason that we have permission today to grieve his loss. It is for that reason we may shed tears and feel sorrow. Our Lord Jesus Christ invites us to share tears when he said, Blessed are those who grieve, for they will be comforted. We have gathered in his name to lament that Mark's presence among us has been cut far too short. Yet our mourning is not without hope, for we know that our Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth, and even though our bodies may die, Yet in our flesh we will see God. For not one person lives to oneself. And not one person dies to oneself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And for this reason, Christ died and lives again, that he may be Lord both of life and death. Let us bow our heads in a time of prayer. Gracious God, make us aware of the shortness and uncertainty of our human lives, and let your Spirit lead us in the right ways of living, so that when we have served you, we may gather with those who have gone on before us, confident in our faith, comforted by your hope, in favor with you, and in peace with all your creation. Give us grace to worship you this afternoon as we celebrate the life of Mark, and to trust in your goodness and mercy. Assure us that because Christ lives, we also might live through Jesus Christ our Lord. In our pain, may we remember how we have failed one another and grieve your heart. Forgive us and free us from guilt. Help us to live lives of love and service to others and to you. 
God of grace, send your Holy Spirit that we may hear your promises and receive them in comfort and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. He who died and rose from the grave to free us from the burdens of the world gives us eternal life. Grant us your mercy. So that when our time on earth is ended, we may be united with all the saints in the joys of your eternal home. All those who call on the name of Jesus experience the abundant freedom of having received forgiveness of sins. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of him, he had his eyes on us for glorious living. It is in Christ that we have salvation and are sealed by his Holy Spirit our deposit guaranteeing eternal life. Lord, be with those gathered here this afternoon. May your presence bring a sense of hope, a sense of healing, and deep comfort. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you look in your bulletins, you'll find that this is entitled Words of Hope. And these are words of hope for people who are feeling overwhelmed or are feeling in a storm or are feeling just at the point where they don't know where to turn. Just as a prelude to the first one from the Gospel according to John, uh, Jesus had just told his disciples that he was going to leave them, he was going to die. And he was trying to comfort them, give them words of hope for the future. The other part about this passage is, is that it's often used at funerals, celebrations of life. And you often think of that mansion as being that heavenly place in which we're going to. But when the uh, Greek, original Greek was translated into English, a mansion was not one of those large, large homes or castles. It was an inn on the side of a road. It was a place where you could stop and rest, be protected, be refreshed, have an opportunity to look onto where you were now going to go. So it's a very present thing. It's a very hope for today. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions, many rooms, many resting places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you where I am. And Thomas, who expresses the doubts of many of us, says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. This is a resting place today. This is a mansion. This is a place that God has prepared for us so that we can see our way into his home. The next passage is Psalm 23, and that's printed in your book, and then I would invite anyone who would like to, to say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff may comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 
The other scripture passages are from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8. Then he got into the boat with his disciples and followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us! We're going to drown! He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. And then from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. So in this resting place today, there's an opportunity for us to share one with another and with God and to know his words of hope are for each and every one of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we sat down and talked about what scriptures we might use to give words of hope to all of us this afternoon, we were just sharing about a series that I was teaching on about Jesus in the boat. And Bob came back from his vacation and said, oh, I was worshiping in another place and we were learning about Jesus in the boat. And Cindy said, I can't think of a better passage because boating is something that meant so much to our family. It was Mark's passion. It is where you and your family and many of your friends had great times with Mark. At the cottage, skiing, doing other water sports. Mark's passion for boating created deep friendships. As I understand from people who were sharing over the last couple of days, he would just invite all kinds of people. It was Mark's way of connecting. Boating was a huge part of your life. And it was on one account that Cindy recounted how sometimes you would be out boating and the storm clouds would sweep in and you would need to make a mad dash for safe harbor. Just recently, Cindy and Mark decided to buy a 32-footer to create new memories this summer. The weather warnings were already out. Mark's health was failing. But the suddenness in which the storm came and enveloped Mark was a surprise. It has left many of us today reeling with questions. Wondering this afternoon what life might look like now that Mark is no longer with us. And we are the ones calling out for calm, for the hope of safe harbor. The passage from Matthew 8 is about a boat, 12 disciples, and a terrible storm. But it is also a passage of hope where Jesus comes in and calms the storm, and calms the storm of life in this boat that we live in. Mark understood what was in store for him. He was open about it and faced the journey through illness, it seems, bravely. Mark was aware of a hope greater than himself, the same hope that is so evident in Cindy and his family. The hope that death does not hold the victory. Many of us have experienced deep loss, trials, sickness, accidents, sorrow. Many, especially our firefighters here today, have seen and experienced things that 
no person should need to see or experience. But we know what to do, don't we? We muster up strength from within and, and we put in place our best coping mechanisms. We push down the waves that attempt to drown us and we determine that life storms will not get the better of us. But pushing water aside is futile. You see, the disciples in chapter 8 were fishermen, and we would be remiss to believe that they were not experienced boaters, or that they had never encountered a fierce storm from which they would need to find safe harbor. And like experienced boaters, they fought valiantly when the storm came. And all the while, Jesus with them on the boat was asleep. Despite their best human efforts, the waves overcame them, they were afraid, and they lost hope. Drowning in fear, they finally cried out, Lord, save us. Jesus, who had been waiting for the call, wakes up, and with one sentence raises his hand and says, Peace, be still, and the storm subsides. It is often when we are faced with our limitations, when we are at our wit's end, when sorrow comes deep into us, that we go in search of hope. And we might choose first to struggle on our own, and we might even blame Jesus for being asleep at the helm. And yet, can you imagine being in the boat without Jesus there? It is in knowing our inability to help ourselves that we too cry out, Lord, save us. You see, the disciples knew that despite all their experience as voters, they could not control the elements. They could not control the bad any more than they could control the good. It was then that these experienced fishermen knew that Jesus alone is in control. It is then when they realize that Jesus was asleep, not because he cared little for the world, or that he cared little for those who suffer, but because he knew. He knew that all things are in the hand of his Father in heaven, who works all things for the good of those who love him. As Jesus rose from his sleep and calms the storm, in our English language it says Jesus called them you of little faith. But if we translate it literally from the Greek, Jesus calls them little faiths. See, he does not call them faithless, but he encourages the faith they do have. And you and I, Followers of Jesus are little faiths, and even a little faith is enough faith. Whatever faith we have to call on Jesus is enough for salvation. It is enough to see us through those difficult times. It is enough to carry us through the raging waters. Even now, as we mourn Mark's passing, when it may feel that Jesus was asleep at the helm, even then, being a little faith will be enough for God's power to strengthen us. To have even a little faith is enough to invite Jesus into the storm. Faith that trusts will see us through. As little faith then, this morning, we are strengthened by His Holy Spirit to help us move forward in faith, rather than despair. To help us replace coping mechanisms with a peace that calms the fiercest storm. I don't have words to explain a spiritual mystery. I can only tell you that from my own experiences in dealing with loss and pain and suffering, that when I have been able to call on the Lord for help, He brings
brings me unexplained tranquility that not only helps me cope, but brings a deep sense of hope that transcends into a peace that passes understanding. And we can only know that peace when we call on Him. Our Heavenly Father invites us this afternoon to journey not as people without hope, to not journey as people who need to do it on their own or in their own strength, but to journey as little faiths, to trust in and lean on God's promise of eternal life. God invites us to lean on Him. He invites us to find His support through others whom we can lean on. Such an invitation can be heard on the radio through the song of Bill Withers who sang, Sometimes in our lives we all have pain. We all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend to help you carry on, for it won't be long till I'm going to need someone to lean on. 2 Corinthians 1 reminds us what to expect after we call on the name of the Lord. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. This consolation is that hope we receive that comes through Jesus Christ who laid down his life, died and was buried and raised to life. He conquered our fear of death by overcoming its sting, its pain and its finality. Jesus showed us there is eternal hope for all who are in him. His victory on the cross and his calming the raging sea is a comforting reminder that no storm lasts forever. No storm can overtake the boat or drown our hope. No storm can ever rob us of our life in Christ. This afternoon, then, we stand as little faiths on safe harbor. With God's empowering strength, we leave behind the fear of the storm. We call out to Jesus and invite his hope to bring us that peace that passes all understanding. This afternoon, we praise the God of all comfort who comforts us. For he has promised that the first heaven and the first earth will pass away, and there will no longer be any sea. God's dwelling place will be among the people. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This afternoon, we pay our final respects and say our final goodbyes to John Mark Mellenbacher. This afternoon, in hope, we surrender John into the arms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We honor Mark, whose life, laughter, joy, and work touched our lives. We praise God, Mark, that you have reached safe harbor. We have opportunity now to hear remembrances from Mark's children, Jeff, Brian, and Kayla. So, 
16 years old, being escorted to a high school formal in a 2004 Red Crown Victoria undercover police interceptor. It's car two for the Burlington Fire Department. My date sitting beside me in the car, my father chatting away to my date's mother. And suddenly I realized I'd forgotten her corsage. So the next minute, we're pulling a U-turn on the highway, lights and sirens blaring, racing back to my house to retrieve the one item that he knew I held with so much importance. Whether the lights and sirens were on or off, our father was a man of principle. He further instilled principle in our brother Jeff. Jeff had returned from first year university with honor and brilliance, but missing one key lesson, the art of the pre-drink. <laughs> For the entire week of seeing old friends that led up to Christmas Eve, Jeff was on the town. I clearly remember my dad sitting him down and saying, listen, you can spend a quarter of my money at the bar if you have three quarters of the drinks at home. This changed Jeff for the better, and those in the crowd that knew dad on a social level can attest to this being a great life lesson for us. Our father was also a man of emotion. Our, mother, our mother's favorite song for both of them was Grand Brown Eyed Girl. He would be the one to subtly turn it up when it was on the radio and to ask her to dance to it. He requested us to sing it on karaoke nights. I remember watching them dance at the Ancaster Community Center on New Year's Eve in 2000 and thinking to myself at age 10 or 12, if only I could have that kind of emotion with my girlfriend. He always sat back at the, at the back of the living room when we had only pizza and uh, movie nights. And in some ways, he acted as a protector through the scary parts. But in others, he was hiding himself from us. He was hiding because he would bawl his eyes out in the touching scene, often sneaking away to eat ice cream upstairs as if his heart had just been broken. And thus, our father was a man of passion. Of course, looking around today, it is evident of a sincere passion for the firefighting community. We recall shift work as children were to be scheduled through Christmas, likely part of the reasoning for bringing candy canes to each station on Christmas Day when he was in management. We remember the tough calls and the long days where he would come home to a welcoming but often chaotic house. Over the past few days, we've heard him be described as the firefighter's fire chief. And this makes sense to, sense to us. We talked to him our entire lives about how he loved to ride the trucks and how the brother and sister had meant so much to him. What few people know, though, is that throughout the early years of his various employers, he worked at Oak Run Bakery. His job at Oak Run Bakery was the high and mighty muffin man. <laughs> he would tell us stories of driving the muffin truck to Toronto in hopes of beating the other muffin man so that he could get his truck filled first. And I think, in retrospect, this must have kept call response times down in Ancaster, St. Catharines, and Burlington. <laughs> Outside of work, both their mothers and fathers' first love, besides each other, was cottaging. They grew up around boats, leading them, their sisters, and cousins to master water sports. His idea of a perfect summer day was coming in from a great slalom and creating a huge wall of water aimed to splash anyone on, near, or around the dock. Post the water ski, a nice drink on the dock, a sunset, and a bonfire would take the cake. This passion has tipped over to us. Our obsession, for lack of a better word, has led us to an endless summer nights, guitar playing, and a cottage lifestyle that we hold incredibly dear to our heart. Our father was a man of love. He spent countless hours with us as children. He taught us to skate, swim, ski, bike, and drive. He loved Jeff, even if he had drank six Coca-Colas, played eight hours of video games, and had no interest in moving. He turned Jeff into a man of strength, inquisitive and strategic, never backing down from an argument, being honest in his defense, and submitting only when it was clearly time. He loved Brian, after a few long props on the boat, a few minor car accidents, and a stubborn tongue. He taught him to see the big picture in things, to work hard and keep his nose clean, and to pursue his ambitions honestly for his own happiness and his future families. And he loved me. He put up with a traveling basketball team and is the reason I'm in the program that I am. He instilled life advice on my trip to first year university, and when I moved into my house in second year, he never failed to leave my freezer packed full with his homemade chicken noodle soup. He watched over me through all the good and the bad times, leading me to say our father was a man of family. There are a countless number of stories we could tell you, a million and one memories that are forever a part of us in our hearts and minds and in who we are today. 
When you weave through each one, you see his joy and love, his laughter and his smile. He was a man of family, the truest form of a great person and the greatest inspiration we have ever had. There are many things we wish he could be a part of. Every big moment to come in our lives will be a bit tougher and a bit emptier. There will always be a bit of sadness. But in the role he played as the best father, leader, and guardian for each of us, he always taught us to keep pushing forward. He taught us to work hard and play hard, and he taught us the importance of family and happiness. To all the friends of the family, the firefighters, the police, and EMS staff, the community dignitaries and supporters for all of this, we thank you on behalf of the Mel Walkers and the Walkers. We know looking out to you how much of an impact he had on your lives too. We hope you always hold in your hearts the types of memories, passions, and lessons he has instilled. He was a loving man and we miss him on this day and forever forward. My name's Dean. I'm the uh, other. Uh, I'm the different brother-in-law. <laughs> I first met Mark 30 years ago. We met in a traditional way that mid 20-year-old dudes met in the 80s, and that is to say, he was bringing Cindy home in the wee hours of the morning on a Saturday night, and he found me throwing pebbles at Shelley's bedroom window. <laughs> and he said, "What are you doing?" said, I'm just trying to convince Shelly to let me in. He said, good luck with that, carry on. <laughs> and carry on we did for the next 30 plus years. Now we started spending a lot of that time at the beginning at uh, Jim and Betty Walker's house, helping out with the chores, eating many dinners, and making out with their daughters. <laughs> we became friends right away, uh, because like most good friends, we shared something in common. And that was our love to tease our mother-in-law, Betty. Uh, we reminded her on a regular basis how lucky she was to have two such strong, good-looking, smart, and modest German fellas to look after her daughters. Mark was relentless in his kidding with her about her cooking, uh, letting her know the roast beef was always burnt even though it was cooked perfectly. This is why we married your daughters. Anyway, I learned very quickly back then that the professional future for Mark was in firefighting. No matter how much we enjoyed ourselves at those dinners, when the volunteer firefighter deeper thing went off, Mark was gone in a flash. And I tried to stop him and remind him not to pee on that fire, just in case it got bigger instead of smaller. <laughs> anyway, so the next 30 years, we uh, both our families grew and we spent much time together for holiday meals vacations in Aurelia, and all sorts of special events and celebrations. In those years, it was obvious that Mark cared very much for his family, and he cared very much for his extended family as well, including ours. Uh, he could always be counted on with the help of Cindy to make sure that my family's life was fun and exciting, and that included his love for boating that you've heard so many times. I watched him as he went from a rubber dinghy to a rowboat, to a powerboat, to the fastest speedboat I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> well, uh, I'll never forget the red wooden boat that he had, I don't know, maybe around 100 horsepower. And uh, he had that while we vacationed in Stony Lake. And he was mad at that boat because it, it just didn't perform the way he wanted it to. So he asked me to get in the boat and we're going to take it over to McCracken's Landing we're going to get it out of the water. So I get into this boat and uh, he's driving very aggressively <laughs> on the way over to McCracken's Land and he's upset at this boat. And when we got close to uh, where we're supposed to be, he, he does this very strong 360 degree turn. And uh, anyways, when I got off the floor of the boat, I looked <laughs> at the back and the transom had separated from the boat. And uh, I say to Mark, Mark, Mark uh, we're taking in water and, and he's driving and without even turning around, he, he hands me this bailing bucket 
you know, take it underwater. Well, five seconds later, we were underwater. <laughs> anyway, we were close enough to shore to drag that scow back to the shore and, uh, and, and get it out of the water. And he just shrugged it off. He said, this is great. Uh, this is my excuse to get a brand new boat, a bigger one. And he did. But over the years, just as his boats got bigger, so did his career in firefighting and rescue. Using a university degree in labor studies, Mark was on a mission to make a difference for all of his employers, his colleagues, and the general public as well. Starting in Ancaster and Hamilton, and then to Burlington, where my mother started the Mark Mellenbacher Fan Club Burlington chapter. He, he finally reached his last position as the fire chief in St. Catharines. Mark reached and lived his professional dream. He did make a difference to the way firefighting is conducted, including improved communication dispatch center and a new fire station located in the Meriton section of St. Catharines. His professional accomplishments will be better de detailed a little bit later by his good friend Trent Gervais, so I'll let him take care of that. Mark was, now, was, was well known for using his sense of humor and kindness to bridge the gap between the firefighters and their employers. Using respect as a basis for any conversation, Mark was met with great support and admiration from both his fellow fighters and his administration staffs. I also see that Mark was a, uh, a strong advocate for the protection of abused women. And if you've not yet seen the pictures of Mark participating in the Walk a Mile in Her Shoes campaign, I encourage you to do so, because when I looked at those pictures, I could tell he cared. Now, I believe that all people in this profession, both employees and management alike, are exceptional individuals for their unselfishness and hard work for the general public. And I'd like to take this opportunity right now just to thank some of you on behalf of Mark's family. The many kind words and wonderful stories that we have all heard over the last few days are just too many to mention here. The, hand, the helpful hands provided from all the firefighters over the last few days were overwhelmed and appreciated by the family. Mark was a witness to your, your drive-by saluting that took place in front of his home over the last few days of his life, both he and his family were deeply moved by this sign of respect. One of the common themes when discussing his work with me was how much he cared for the brave men and women for whom he was responsible to ensure their safety and well-being. I can say with certainty that Mark genuinely cared very much for all of you, so thank you. I'm going to give one example that I, I saw, and that was near the end. While in his home in Ancaster, when Mark was incapable of even supporting his own weight, I went to the Ancaster Fire Department, who had no idea of even who I was, and I asked for some help with moving him from the upstairs bed to a more comfortable hospital bed that we had gotten put into the living room. Their response was, of course we can help. And help they did. Four of them, including the captain, came to the house with a stair chair that made the move more efficient and painless for Mark. To you guys, I have to let you know what you really did. What you really did was this. Although Mark was incapable of speech, his family could tell by his eyes and by his facial expressions that he was so proud to have you come into his home and to do this for him. You didn't provide a stair chair, you provided a throne. And Mark was on parade. And you made him feel like the most important fire chief, the fire king on the planet. And for that, we all thank you very much. Special thanks are deserved to the administration staff of both the St. Catharines Fire Department, including the Acting Chief, Dave Wood, who's been a rock to this family. Wherever you are, thank you. And City Hall, including the Mayor himself, Brian McMullen, who provided so much care and support to Mark over the last few years. Your efforts made this agonizing struggle bearable to both him and his family. I hope you all understand 
that you literally provided the real gift of life to Mark and to the entire Mellenbacher family as a result of your very generous and kind support. On behalf of the entire family and all those who have had a chance to be with Mark in the last couple of years, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Hold on a second. Although it is now obvious that Mark was well respected in his career, the same can be said about his personal life. Enjoying life, enjoying life with his family was Mark's true passion. Mark was a leader in our family as well. All the extended family knew Mark and looked forward to spending quality time with him. As you are aware by now, when you meet Mark for the very first time, you say to yourself, this is a person I want to hang out with. He was true to his word and someone you could always rely on. His loving sisters, Lori and Kim, they would like to express some of their thoughts to you about the big brother. I've written down some of the things that the, we talked about before I got to know Mark, and I'd like to share them with you here. They tell me that Mark was always a very focused brother, even as a child. In public school, he already showed care for the people around him by being the school crossing guard. Now he would ride his bike to school every day through snow, rain, whatever, so that he could get to school on time to do this job. Lori watched him as he fell from his bike many times on an icy day, and Mark would just keep getting up and going. He had a job to do, he was going to get there. And yes, there was sibling rivalry one time, Lori and Mark were having a, a real good fight, and uh, she got uh, some st stools were thrown. <laughs> she was getting ready to go to her brownie class, and by the time it was over, Mark had a brownie star cut right across his eye, and uh, Lori, I think, had a red butt from her parents, I'm not sure. <laughs> this type of behavior continued one winter when Lori went to go to Ken, Ken Sims backyard ice rink. Mark didn't want her to be there, so Ken and Mark put her in net and spent the afternoon taking slap shots on her until she cried and left. <laughs> Kim was very good at tricking Mark. Her specialty was being able to make a very accurate sound of that firearm sound uh, when it went off. And she used it many times when Mark was a volunteer firefighter. Many a time, Mark would spring up. She would do this sound, and Mark would spring to his feet and run to the door before he realized that Kim had tricked him again. In the end, Lori and Kim will remember Mark for being a caring brother who was capable of much love and support. And now they have a hole in their heart that has been left there by a brother gone too soon. As you are aware, when you meet Mark, you want to hang out with him and be with him. I see all you people here, and I know you all feel the same way. He had many friends, and that was no accident. He had a personality that drew people to him. With Cindy, they were the host and the hostess, with the most and the hostess. Many a party were given, and I met so many of his wonderful friends and people who share the same family and fun ideals that made us all better people. Even in the last days, I've heard stories of the dead fish found in the bed up in Mount Julian, the funnel, which I saw a picture of, and many other tales that would keep any therapist up at night. Mark's best friend, Ken Sims, has been a very loyal friend of Mark through thick and thin, good and bad. Ken was everything Mark needed in a good friend. A pat in the back, a kick in the behind were both dispensed as necessary. Mark loved you, Ken, and your loyalty and your advice to him and his family will always be welcomed and appreciated. His sister-in-law, Nurse Sheely, and Mark started out as stubborn adversaries, believe it or not. 
And over the years, they became good friends and spent many nights talking shop talk and swapping professional ideas. Shelly was a great help to Cindy and her family in the last few weeks, and it was appreciated, Shelly. Mark has left a lasting impression on the entire Schmidt family. He will be remembered forever. Sisters Lori and Kim and their children were a big part of Mark's life as well. They were always welcome in his homes and at the cottage. He didn't complain of the intrusion much, as Mark used to say, but instead rejoiced in your company. Cody told me a story yesterday that was typical of Mark, so I want to share that one with you. We all know how much Mark hated candles in the house. But Cody decided to buy one of those small backyard fire stands that had the lid on it, and it was legal. And uh, he bought it for the house in St. Catharines. Of course, Mark came home, and he did that act. What are you doing? You're going to give me a heart attack. What are we, uh, I'm going to have a stroke here. What if my own fire department has to come to my, the chief's house and put out the fire? Will you stop? Anyway, eventually Mark calmed down, and he joined Cody like he joined him so many other times for a beer around a nice warm fire. So I know you are very happy, all of you, to have Mark as your brother and as your uncle. To Mark's parents, Yvonne and Mo, thank you for raising such a fine individual. No parent should have to bury their child. It's just not right. I know how much Mark loved you. I was a witness to it. I also know how proud you were of him and how much he meant to both of you. This love does not go away when one passes on. It stays with us, and as it will in both of you. I will meet you at the dock someday during happy hour, and we will discuss this, but with smiles on our faces instead of tears in our eyes. To his children, Brian, Jeff, and Kayla, Mark had nothing but love for all three of He told me that the recent trip that you guys took to Florida was one of the best times in his life. That trip inspired him to make a conscious effort to be with you as much as he could, and he did. You must forgive your father for any pain or grief that he may have caused you in your lifetime. Please understand that it is true that fathers can make mistakes. We do. But the father's love is never ending. Even after death, I know this to be true. He is part of you, and that is just not too shabby. You all have special gifts that perhaps in some cases were given to you by your father. Enjoy your lives. Revel in the experiences and the rewards that will be sowed upon you as a result of his influence. Remember, he will be with you for the rest of your life. He will be celebrating during the good times and crying with you during the sad times. He will be there, guys. Cindy. Mark loved you from the first moment he made eyes on you in high school. He couldn't shake his feelings for you, so he had to marry you. And together you had three wonderful children, and then together the two of you have shared a lifetime of memories. What can I tell you, Cindy? Men are funny. We all start off young and stupid, and all we do is get older. <laughs> Marriages have their ups and downs. They have their good times and their bad times. Not all wives are as lucky as your sister, Shelley. <laughs> we have all heard the say, behind every good man is a good woman. I do not think this saying was written by a woman as a joke. 
but rather by a man who wanted to thank his wife for such a wonderful life. Let me explain. I don't think if there's only one thing that a man could have in his life, it would be the true love and devotion of a loving partner. It's the absolutely best feeling in the world. When a man has that, he can accomplish anything in his life. That is why he is thankful to his wife. And Cindy, I know you gave that gift to Mark. I know it. In the end, when Mark was unable to speak, I saw him gently take your hand, and he looked at you with eyes that said, thank you for giving me such a wonderful life. Mark died happy, knowing because of your steadfast love and your devotion that he felt from you. He leaves us knowing that you were the best thing that ever happened to him in his life, Cindy. I'm very thankful that Mark has surrounded himself with such a loving family, wonderful friends, and supportive and caring colleagues. I implore to all that we continue to support each other in the coming years in order to find a way to enjoy life to the best of our abilities. After all, Mark would not have wanted it any other way. Finally, I have to say one more thing, and that is, I believe in a God. I believe in a heaven. And I believe Mark is in heaven right now. I can picture him. He's already got himself a new boat. It has twin million horsepower inboard motors on the back of it. He's doing Mach 10 down some pristine, calm, beautiful lake. And God is right beside him as his passenger. God is wearing a six-point harness. <laughs> his hands, white knuckle clenched to the armrest in the seat beside him. And all he can see is that sticker that Mark had on one of his boats on that dead board that read, sit down, hold on, and shut up. <laughs> God speak to you, Mark. We will all miss you very much. Thank you. Some of Mark's accomplishments 
He should be about 110, but over 33 years in the fire service. He's a director on the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs. He was chair of the Urban Committee for the OFC. He was chair of the EMS TIP Committee for the OFC. He was fire coordinator on behalf of the Ontario uh, uh, Office of the Fire Marshal. He was a past director on the Ontario Association of Emergency Planners. Jillian's Walk a Mile in Her Shoes fundraiser. I gotta tell you, he sent me several pictures all year long of practicing for that through the years. <laughs> Incident commander of several large fires and emergencies and disasters. Served on Ancaster, Hamilton, Burnham, St. Catherine's Fire Services during his career. He was a strong advocate of community emergency preparedness. He was also a passionate lover of anything deep fried, or more important, any vodka that comes in a plastic bottle. Chief Mellenbacher worked hard right up to the end. He loved the service and he loved serving his community. When someone close to you passes away, you feel anger, you feel resentment, you question God, and you play the what if game. I won't ask you not to do that, but what I would encourage you to do is remember Mark's legacy always. Never forget him. Wonder what he would say or do a little more often. Laugh when you use a Markism. Are you kidding me? When Mark left the boat that day, I knew in my heart that he was saying goodbye. I wasn't ready for it, and neither was he. My last official BPM from my friend came a few weeks ago, the day after seizure. It said, happy birthday. Miss you, my friend. We'll all remember something about Mark, his smile, his kind heart, and perhaps something he did or said. For me, our last interaction will make me smile for the rest of my life. At his cottage, I was sitting on the edge of his bed, he was tired and it was time for him to rest. I leaned down and kissed him on the cheek. And he said, you're not going to kiss me, are you? <laughs> we both laughed, and I whispered in his ear, sleep well, Chief. Rest in peace. Thank you all very much for those fond memories of Mark. Brian has written a song called Little Lullaby that he will now share with us.
some members of the family who would like to share with us a fire chief's prayer. Amen, amen, and amen. 